Good evening, everyone. I trust everyone is staying safe. Um, we started this task force to discuss how to move our industry uh, into a place where we had one industry-wide guideline that we could all follow, as I've said every week for I don't know how many weeks now. Um, since many of us are going back to work, raise your hand on this call right now if you're going back to work or already we're at work. Yeah. Um, the PGA task force is going to be publishing our series of documents uh, this week, probably Friday. Um, uh, and it's for producers working in a non-studio environment that you can lose, use as a guideline for safely planning your production. So again, the summary, uh, the documents are a summary of the AMPTP and the Safe Way Forward, um, written specifically from a producer's perspective, a green light questionnaire, and pre-production documents and recommendations, uh, red light protocols, codes of conduct, um, new job requirements um, and descriptions, and what we're gonna talk about tonight, which is budget considerations and tips from the field, um, which are suggestions and helpful hints from uh, other producers that have already been in the field, some of whom are here tonight. Um, we'll officially release these documents, as I said, we think on Friday. Obviously, as a word of caution, these are just guidelines. Everyone still needs to do their own production safety plan and get their own advice from their own council. And those of you who are being asked to work on a project, you should review the COVID safety plan and make sure that the plan provides you what you feel comfortable going back to work with. Um, these documents were really only possible with the great work of every single person on this call and a plethora of other people behind the scenes, including people from the AP Council. And I would love to just go through and have everyone give us a quick introduction. So when I call you, please introduce yourself, Harvey. Hi, Harvey Wilson. I'm an EIC line producer, mostly in nonfiction, I'm currently working out of LA. But I'm going to do a quick PSA. Flu shots are available now. Get your flu shots. Get them now so that when the COVID flu shots are, are available, your the vaccines are available, you're ready for it. But this is... Uh, it's going to be a nasty season. So let's get the flu out of the way with those vaccines. Great. Jen. Hi, guys. Jen here. I'm a line producer in DGA UPM. I've um, been working with the Producers Guild since about 2013 on uh, best practices for production safety and keeping your team safe, not just in the land of COVID, but just entirely in production safety. So glad you're here. Hey, Lee. Uh, I'm Haley Sweet. I'm a UPM currently on a Sony project in Toronto. Michelle. Hi, Michelle Bird, Associate National uh, Executive Director for the Producers Guild. Sarah. I am Sarah White, and I am a producer on um, a, currently on a show for ABC called Station 19. And just so you know, both Jen and Sarah, any beautiful, pretty flowcharty pictures that you see in the documents that come out on Friday are because of these two wonderful women, making it easier for us to follow. <laughs> Yolanda. Hi, I'm Yolanda Cochran, producer, currently studio executive with Nickelodeon and Awesomeness TV, and I serve on the board of directors as well as this fantastic task force. Mary Jo. Hi, Mary Jo Winkler. I'm a New York-based film and television producer. I am currently executive producing a television series that will, uh, for a fact that will be filming in Toronto. Fantastic, Gary. You're mute, Gary. Sorry, uh, Gary Lucchese, former president of the Producers Guild with Laurie McCreary, um, now president emeritus with Laurie McCreary and uh, partners at Revelations Entertainment with Laurie McCreary. So, <laughs> so uh, we look forward to talking to you. Bob. Hi, I'm uh, Bob Salerno, New York-based, uh, formerly Los Angeles-based, but now New York-based uh, independent producer, sitting on this great uh, safety committee, trying to come up with uh, a way forward. 
Uh, and I also am involved with a committee um, that the bond company film finances uh, is running as well, trying to figure out how to get independent films up and running, uh, which is a little bit more of a challenge. Yeah, by the way, Bob, we did, they did a complete review of our documents and because of your input, they had some comments, but not as many as they would without your help with them. So they were really pleased and, right. and extolled your virtues. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Chris. Hi, my name is Chris Tomes. I'm a former chair of the New Media Council for the Producers Guild, and I'm, I'm currently a studio executive overseeing creative services at Disney Television Studios. And the one person I know that's been doing dry runs, which is yes. fascinating to me. Yeah, in fact, I think tonight I have a couple of uh, little stories that I'll pepper in as we go through some of the details about that infamous Thank dry you. run. <laughs> good, good, that's great. Susan. Hi, Susan Sprung, National Executive Director of the Producers Guild. Uh, Kyle. Hi, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Kyle Katz, uh, Director of Member Services for the uh, Producers Guild based on the West Coast. And Diana. Hi, I'm Diana White, Manager of Member Services and Events for the PGA uh, based on the East Coast. It's amazing to me both Kyle and Diana are on every single PGA Zoom I've been on and I feel like I've been on them constantly nonstop since March and uh, and you guys are such dead, I don't know how you do it going from one of these to the next to the next and making sure that you get all the slides and everything perfectly. So just want to give a special thank you because it is a you know, behind the scenes job that not everyone knows how hard it is back there uh, doing, making it all look so smooth. So thank you. Thank you. That's very nice. Um, okay, so we're going to go through the um, the budgeting piece, um, our recommendations for budgets. These are not anything um, hard and fast, but it's based on our own experience and things that we've been um, talking to our friends and colleagues in the industry. And um, I'm going to just start with the first biggie, which might depress people, which is we suggest a COVID specific contingent contingency in addition to the contingency you already have in your budget. And these are for things that are unexpected. So it doesn't include testing and all the things that we already know are going to happen. Um, it really should be used to cover potential costs that are unexpected. So I don't, if you need, if somebody, um, if you don't have insurance and you have to shut down for a period of time or um, a member tests positive and you need to quarantine people or additional cast and crew fees that come up or per diem um, that you weren't expecting. So any, any COVID related shutdown or restart, restarting costs. And that's, what, that's a catch all. Obviously it's up to you to put in the amount that you want. Obviously if you have a bond company, they prefer to have a little more and your financer I'm sure will prefer to have a little less. So negotiate as much as you can to cover as much as uh, that, that we're not expecting. And I'm gonna pass it off now to Bob to start going through our personnel considerations. Yeah, so for personnel, uh, obviously in the time of COVID, there are some additional uh, um, team members that you'll probably need to, you'll, you, you will need to add to, the, um, to your set. Um, uh, first and, and foremost is a COVID uh, health and safety supervisor, the HS, HSS. Um, it's uh, what you've seen referred to in many documents. Uh, somebody that would uh, manage uh, all of what's going on with the COVID needs, probably two to four assistants, depending on what the, uh, the scope and the, and the, of your project is. Uh, this is not not including PAs. Um, and also what would be, we're recommending is uh, one support team member per 20 cast and crew people that are that are there so out of the you know two to four assistants you can kind of figure out through there um, the PCR tests need a, a nurse or some trained EMT to administer so you're going to need to plan for additional uh, crew based on the size and the the amount of tests that you're going to be administering each day as well as it's we, we recommend considering a doctor um, local doctor on a retainer, possibly, or a nurse, uh, physician's assistant, somebody to help you uh, through that process. Um, 
And then just to kind of in generalize with the crew, the, the shooting crew, just should be planning for additional time for, for prepping uh, to come up with the, the new protocols that we lay, that there are laid out. Uh, you'll need to figure out uh, just how the set is gonna operate. Additional prep time for the ADs, the UPM for sure, figuring out how to schedule the 10 hour days and make it work. And if there's block shooting, uh, you'll also need to, you know, these people have to be figuring a lot of aspects of what it is to shoot on a set during COVID from time off breaks with the masks to, to just everything else. There's also going to be a remote period when you're working in COVID where the first uh, few weeks, it could, depending again on the size of your show, could be two to five to six weeks of pre-production that all happens remotely on your computers. So you may want to take into account some uh, prep uh, for these, for home kit rentals or additional office needs that each person would have having to work from home. Uh, possible crew bumps as people come in and out. Uh, if there is a safety issue and somebody is testing positive, you need, they need to be pulled immediately. Uh, coming up with backup, uh, you know, we, we, we suggest finding somebody on the crew uh, ahead of time, everybody pointing out and figuring out who that person would be, but you would probably have to have some crew bumps during this, this period as you, you, you give people uh, a little padding there. Um, just all the department heads, again, having ample crew, uh, prep time to figure out, they're all gonna be in new worlds themselves, figuring out their space. They probably need a few more you know, days to, to get up to speed before they can actually even start their job. Uh, so to con consider that, uh, crew backup, if there's somebody that needs to be on hold uh, that is waiting in the wings for DPs, designers, uh, just, just people that are uh, really difficult or uh, sometimes difficult to replace, uh, keeping backups possibly in, the, uh, in a holding, holding place. Um, on multi-camera shows, having A and B control room teams in order to minimize exposure, uh, increasing available coverage if someone gets ill, additional pay for pre-shoot days, testing, quarantine time for the staff and the crew while they're coming in, additional compensation for cast and crew for the screenings. Uh, they're gonna be required to, to test and they will probably require some, some form of payment and everyone should just kind of figure out their own, uh, what, what, what works best for them and is agreed upon. Additional assistants and PAs remaining targeted on assignments, more hair and makeup, wardrobe personnel, probably be dealing with fewer talent. Um, but higher kit fees and disposable communal use of, uh, of, of these, these items. Uh, additional drivers and vehicles, keeping all department trucks completely separate from other departments, minimizing the crew using each vehicle. So you'll have to keep in, to, in account the transportation aspects of it. Uh, on unscripted series requiring a 24 seven production schedule, crew members need to adhere still to the 10 hour workday. Uh, so the, possibly going to need additional staffing in order to accommodate that. Designating crew members from each department to sanitize the equipment. So be able to keep cleaning um, and budgeting for the overtime allowances for this, as well as day players uh, uh, trying to avoid carrying anticipated additional labor week by week. Uh, there's, there's, you possibly may need to have more day players because there's uh, more time for the day players because you're, they're, uh, they're going to be testing and wanting to stay quarantined. Perfect. Uh, Haley, you want to hit cast? Um, sure. Uh, something to really keep in mind is uh, day players and uh, drop pickups. So if you're trying to stay in a testing protocol, whether that's once a week, three times a week, five times a week, seven times a week, um, you want to try to keep the casting bubble as coherent as possible. So if you do have day players, you really may want to consider it's a budgetary hit, but from the time they test to the time they work, expanding that over potentially a week. If you do need to fit them, you do still need the 48 hours to test them. It becomes a bigger expense for a day player. So these are script concerns and script ideas to maybe combine some of the day players. Same thing with stunts. So look at your overall stunt universe and see if you're able to combine some of the stunts or work through your schedule and make some of that stuff um, 
put it all together so that you're not wasting manpower. So that if you've got somebody working Monday and Tuesday, but they don't work Wednesday, Thursday, but they work again on Friday, that becomes a weekly person because you can't really drop them. Um, sorry, my phone's ringing. I don't know why. Sorry. Um, for background, uh, the same thing. If you can consider taking a group of people and potentially putting them into a cohort or a group, um, 20 people over a couple of weeks, test them, ask them to be thoughtful and considerate. This is a, a we thing, not a me thing. So to stay, uh, to stay masked, to stay socially distant, to, um, to do all the things that you ask your crew to do and you keep them over a period of time, you may not need them every single day, but to have that group and move them in foreground or background, but the same people is certainly helpful. I mean, we, we're, we're planning to do that now. Um, you have to consider the amount of testing time before you even fit someone. So when you're doing your budget, just take into consideration that your weekly player, if you really need them to work for five days, really becomes more than that. Great. Thank you. Who's next? Testing. Testing. Um, so testing on a, a film or television show can actually be one of the most expensive parts of the COVID experience. Um, you know, it, it's best to um, review the protocols, at, you know, to plan the number of tests. Um, you know, I think most of us, and you know, everybody is essentially working in zone systems. And I have found that something that's helped my production uh, our, the line producer and the one of our IDs actually took a call sheet and color coded zones and actually started to do a body count for the shooting crew and then also, you know, went through the prep crew as well. And, um, you know, it is, it's daunting, but, you know, getting those numbers, you know, really figuring out what zone people are in, if whether they're getting tested one time a week or three times a week is really important. Um, and then, uh, setting up the testing um, on site. So, you know, what I think, I'm on a studio project and, you know, what we are doing is uh, right now in the interim until we're completely set up, we are working with other um, shows that are being produced by the same company. So the small amount of people we have now are being tested at a site that is, is a site that the company is using once our facility is set up, we will have a honey wagon and we will have people coming in and getting tested on a, you know, on a, a regular basis, depending on what zone they're in. Um, having medical screening and checkpoint stations set up and staffed at each of your entrances for sets, offices, shops, and stages is very important um, to, to literally take a temperature of where people are when they're coming into work. <laughs> Um, the cost of the PCR tests, rapid PCR tests, associated specimen collection costs and lab fees. I, um, and I, I'd be interested what everyone else on this um, Zoom is finding. We're finding that, I mean, we are, the average price of the test seem to be somewhere around 150 per test. I, some, you know, are, have been priced at 120, some are, are you know higher if, if, if you're using a concierge uh, service for some of your pre-employment testing. Um, I'm curious if anyone's had any other, um, if that's around the same price as everyone else is finding these days. I think um, that's at, I think that's at um, scale when, when it's fewer, like we have 15 right. through productions going around, it's much higher. Right, right. Um, and then for us, at least for the production I'm on, we, our company, you know, needed to actually find a testing, you know, the tests and a lab in Toronto and contracted both of those companies outside of, you know, prior to us sort of starting. So testing came into place, you know, before anybody could really get started. Um, you'll have to account for labor and devices associated with daily supervised screenings um, for symptoms, including temperature checks at the start of each day and anyone entering the production areas. Um, you should consider a soft, some form of software 
for daily staff and crew questionnaires and temperature records. Um, you'll have to figure out a good private way to keep record um, to maintain for insurance purposes. Um, also, at-home testing will have to be organized um, by production prior to crew members or cast using public transportation or reporting to location. So we have a handful of people that will be traveling to Toronto in our show, and the protocol that we have in place, which was dictated by, the, by our, comp our studio, was we have to have uh, pre-employment tests. So before anyone gets on a plane, they have to be tested. And actually, this is, I believe, SAG and DGA as well, that for, within 48 hours of that test, you need to travel. To, uh, of, a, of a negative um, test, you need to travel. We, our company is also testing again uh, a couple days after people land and testing again prior to actually, um, there's a 14-day quarantine period in Toronto, so we're testing again prior to people coming into an office. Um, so you have to really take that into consideration when you're doing your numbers. Um, you also have to account for time added to the daily schedule for testing, which I know Bob has been brought up, Bob and um, Haley brought up as well, before or after work, and then the time it takes to wait for the results. So uh, I think it varies. I'm curious, again, what everybody on this Zoom is experiencing. We have tested, we've tested very few people so far. Next week we're starting, we have 70 people that are being tested and that's sort of our biggest number as we're moving closer, you know, we're, we'll be eight weeks out next week and it just gets bigger and bigger every week. And what we're finding is the handful of people who were tested last week, the first test, uh, my line producer's now been tested once a week and the first test, it was a 36 hour turnaround. And then this week it was better. It was like 25 hours. So it's, you know, every, mm -hmm. test, every testing company differs. Um, we're finding that it's getting easier for these companies who are now getting into the practice of, of handling all these shows. Um, and I think you also have to just account for like, it's not an exact, it, it, it may not be exacting. So sort of giving yourself a little bit of space of when that person has to start the first task or show up at the office to give yourself that wiggle room and try to be flexible with it. Um, you know, we're so used to everything being on time of the minute, you get a call, you show up. And I think you just have to try to game uh, once you get into a testing rhythm. Um, and then of course, compensation to the cast and crew uh, for the time it takes to test and establishing, of course, establishing all of that upfront um, is key so that you're not having, uh, you know, your management team is not, um, you know, uh, dealing with that on the day. Thank you, Mary Jo. I'm going to hit ventilation and then I'm going to ask um, quickly for everyone who's already been assigned a section, just pick two or three of the highlights of those because I just realized we're going to be publishing these on Friday, so we don't need to go into such detail. And then I'd love to um, start talking more about kind of the practical application and the issues that we've run into, because I think that will be, uh, I, I want to hear from you guys as well. So um, ventilation has uh, turned out to be right up there with testing for the unions. Um, and that's the ventilation of every single location, stage, shop, dressing room, offices. You have to assess everything, upgrade the HVAC to a certain level, or, um, or set it up with a fil filtration system that's portable, needs to be approved in advance by SAG and other appropriate unions, but we also suggest that you go to the minimums on, on, on um, non-union shows. It's really important. This is where when you're in a stage space, people are talking and the particles are all over the place and you need to not only have systems that will clear out the space, you need to open and vent out your locations and sets and offices, we're recommending once an hour or once every two hours, depending upon how big the space is and how many people you have in it. Um, this is uh, literally right after testing comes ventilation. So make sure you have that in your safety protocols. Gary, cleaning. Well, cleaning is a little more mundane than ventilation, but cleaning, <laughs> um, you know, they want to make sure that we've cleaned the offices, the restroom stages, dressing rooms, there has to be a separate cleaning crew uh, to sanitize the set, the stage, the stage, location, the base camp. And obviously the cleaning has to be done multiple times a day. 
especially restrooms, uh, multiple executive bathrooms on location with somebody to regulate the service and sanitize them. Trash cans have to have no touch lids, uh, separate trash receptacles for used PPE. Uh, so it's, 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 it's everything, but it's, it's, it's a little more mundane than ventilation. Great, thank you. Um, I'll take PPE. Great. Okay, so um, if you are, uh, you need to have enough PPE, so for, for your crew for every day, and then more, because uh, even in our dry run, you know, we were given these little packets and face shields and uh, hand sanitizer and everything, and um, people, not only would they run out, but they would misplace it. And so you just have to have a lot more than you think that you're gonna need because people are gonna, they're just gonna tear through it. Um, a COVID kit like this is really helpful. I mean, it's just, they gave it to us in a little bag and um, it had both disposable uh, face shields as well as reusable ones that can be washed. Um, you also maybe wanna consider having color coding um, on your reusable face shields, if that's what people are really gonna be using so that you could clearly identify people per zone, because that's something you can see right on their face. So if you're zone A, you know you're this, you're zone B, you know you're that. Um, N95 masks are obviously uh, optimal. Um, and then also just make sure that for camera crew or anybody that's in zone A that's right in your talent, you really are gonna wanna be thoughtful about uh, extra precaution like face shields and things like that. Um, you want to make sure your camera operators understand, though, that they're going to be looking through a shield. And so uh, for those people, you want to opt for like a high quality shield. You don't want them saying, I can't see uh, through my lens. I can't see what I'm doing. That's not that's not going to be ideal. Um, and then uh, you want to make sure that you have, you know, PPE equipment everywhere. You want to have um, uh, hand sanitizer, basically, at, at anywhere you possibly can, especially in areas where uh, you may have um, people in zone A going back and forth from different zones. So just consider that in your budget. Like you can't just have one thing for everybody for every day. You need to have extra, that's for sure. Perfect. Um, Haley, office requirements, are you up for that? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, think about your office. I mean, you've already covered ventilation, um, you covered cleaning, but some of the things that are almost common sense to think about. People shouldn't face each other. Um, determine the size of your offices and the occupancy. Um, something that, that we're doing on our show and that I've seen a lot of other people doing is they're either building plexiglass barriers or doing boat vinyl or some other sort of thick, clear plastic. Um, we're actually building uh, rolling racks with clear plastic that we can roll around to be able to talk to people and, and have some, a barrier between us. It's just something to, to think about. If you have a bullpen area, putting up some sort of barrier helps. Again, don't have people face each other, have them face apart. And just consider how many people actually really have to work in the office. Consider your kitchen, how many people can actually be in the kitchen and supply PPE to clean the kitchen if you even open a kitchen. And the same thing with restrooms. Um, Gary, when he talked about cleaning, having a cleaning service come in throughout the day and do high touch surfaces and then doing a thorough cleaning at night, it's pretty important. Great, thank you. I think we're gonna go to travel and li living for with Yolanda and then skip all the way down to uh, insur overhead and insurance fees for Gary and then start talking about real life applications. Yep. So travel and living, um, if you are traveling to a distant location, things to think about that you'll need to budget for are the fact that you'll need to do testing prior to travel. And depending upon your destination, you will have guidelines specifying the length of quarantine in those locations. So you'll want to um, be budgeting for the cost associated with that quarantine, um, accommodations, um, your per diems or living allowances. Uh, also, um, depending upon whatever negotiations you've done with your guilds and unions, you, there might be compensation involved with the time spent in quarantine. Um, as far as booking travel on flights, you should consider booking um, uh, seats where 
you are purchasing a seat next to someone, especially for someone who is high value in zone A. I know that there are currently some airlines who are still um, having a practice of not uh, booking any seats in the middle row. One of them is Delta, which is a great partner of PGA, and I believe also Southwest, but you should check on that. Um, some productions are considering booking an entire hotel, depending upon um, the demands of your production and your location. You might want to consider booking an entire hotel or booking an entire floor, um, means to isolate your crew from other people occupying that accommodation. And if you have multiple locations, you might want to make sure that you're allowing for enough time to um, have an additional stay because you're gonna be dealing with additional testing as well as additional quarantine periods. Um, and then also one final thing, um, one of the major items to consider is depending upon your production timing, um, the demands of it, uh, you might want to consider um, housing your local crew. Um, this is kind of like the Tyler Perry uh, scenario like in uh, we're not all <laughs> all of our budgets don't accommodate that but it might make sense even I've seen and in planning for um, housing local cast on a particular production just to make sure it's a shorter shoot it's going to be over the course of two weeks and we just want to make sure that the, that cast remains isolated so you might want to consider budgeting for that Great. Thank you. Gary, overhead and insurance. Well, I, I, I had a conversation today with um, a friend of mine, Paul Jones, who used to run Albert G. Rubin and Aon, and now he works at Hub. And we were talking about the insurance situation because I had heard that there was a company in Canada, Front Row, that was doing insurance on independent films, which indeed is the case. But their insurance, their COVID insurance is 10% of the budget. And he also said that the, the, the other company that's beginning to get into this is Berkshire Hathaway, who we know is well, well financed. But again, on a $20 million picture, their premium was $2 million and it's a 10% deductible. So it's, yeah, there is some insurance out there, but it's, it's really expensive. Uh, what, what, what you see is you see the big streamers, Amazon, Netflix, um, Apple self-insuring. And um, um, he said MGM actually had, had done some self-insurance as well. But again, they've, they've got a $5 million deductible. So they're really insuring against um, a huge shutdown. Um, so, so there is some insurance on the independent front, but it's, it's very costly. And uh, that's, that's what the situation is right now. I mean, Bob, you may have some more knowledge about that as well, but that, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I keep hearing, I've heard similar to what you've said, actually, that there is some independent insurance, but it's uh, extremely expensive in order for a independent film to, to afford. Most independent films can't afford it. It's right. all I've really been hearing about, and the, I know that the Bond Company has also, are projects that are, as you said, streamers that are people that are able to self-insure. There's been uh, there was actually one independent film that actually did go with the Bond Company that the an independent financier mm -hmm. did agree to self-insure as well himself, but. That they that seemed to be a, a, a definite outlier. Uh, independent financiers weren't looking to to take that risk on. It might be a little easier. We have a production that looks like it's going to have. It's an international production. Looks like it's going to have um, half the production shot in London, so that we qualify to get the insurance back, uh, the government backed insurance for that production. So sometimes you can do things like change location to qualify for <laughs> government backed insurance. Uh, Indies, it's, it's a little tricky, but um, I'd love to go now. We have about 21 minutes. I'd love to go and um, open it up to questions and also maybe ask Chris to start with some of the things that you've learned in your dry runs and then also throw it to those of you who are in actual in prep or production to give any tips, things that you have learned along the way that would help those listening tonight or later. Sure. So I'll start by um, just for, cause I sp spoke about this, I think two weeks ago, but if, if you didn't hear, I, we did a dry run at Disney TV studios for a scripted uh, show. Um, it was actually for blackish and, um, 
we, at the, at the time, we were actually shooting a safety video too. So I was really able to see a lot of the protocols that I, I don't think I normally would have because I, I went everywhere from makeup to literally watching them build um, the cameras um, to prepping carts, everything. A couple of things that stood out to me were, um, as we learned, just need to be very, very clear about rotation of zones. Because uh, on our stage, one of the things we realized was that, you know, the zones move. So they're not just like, oh, you're always over there and you're physically always over there. People have to clear out. So these zones literally move in and move off the, the stage. And so you've got to build time in for that, but you've also got to be really clear about what direction people walk, which is surprising. But if you've been into Trader Joe's, of course, they've got the arrows on the floor, walk this way, and then don't go down this aisle, that direction, get your chips and your cheese this way. It's the same thing and probably even more important because it's dark, the corridors are really um, narrow. And uh, so just be really clear about what direction people need to go. Um, signage can be easily overlooked, especially if you're wearing something like this and you uh -huh. can't see that well. So you just need to make sure things are, you know, up high and kind of visible for people. And uh, sets are dangerous anyway with cables and everything. So just make sure that people really, because their visibility is going to be severely limited, um, that it's, it's, you know, things are out of the way. The other thing was there were surprising things that um, when you are, prepping a set and you're cleaning a set and you're doing everything. If you have a set that you've been on before, a standing set, or if you're, if you're building it again or whatnot, simple things like greenery, you may not have room for it if you've got to create dual passageways around the stage. Um, you've got to just, you've got to change how much you use your space. So just be cognizant of that, that surprisingly, a lot of these uh, protocols, they take up physical space. You need more room between people constantly. So clarity around signage and then clarity between where people go and what direction they move at what time is really important because um, you can't always just have people sitting there directing traffic. Um, you need people to you know, be able to watch signs. Great. Anyone else want to jump in? One thing I wanted to say was um, have consideration for your crew. Uh, a small expense in the overall uh, budget might be to add health insurance um, for your crew for people who don't have it. Um, you know, it's, it's maybe a few hundred dollars a month at most. And for your crew members who are uh, uninsured, and there are plenty, um, it would meet, might make the difference uh, if they happen to contract COVID or any injury on the set um, going forward. So give that more consideration than we have in the past. Great. And another one of the big things that I, I learned uh, with film finance is we did a, a little uh, forum for producers uh, and we had a group of producers that had shot and wrapped projects uh, in, in all sorts of ranges, but some were, uh, had just finished the Coen Brothers uh, new film. They had, uh, uh, Macbeth, I think it was, they, um, they shut down in the middle of production and, and had to start up again. Guy Ritchie also had a, a show that he did with Miramax that they still had two weeks left of shooting on that and they, they went and did that. And uh, there was a group of people, but everybody that had produced and finished a show during COVID though, all came back with the same uh, thing to consider with the crew, which was uh, the emotional component, which is actually a budgetary component. The crew was highly uh, sensitive and emotional, and they were always on edge. And one thing that they did, and they just planned for, and was part of this contingency for COVID, was that when the shop steward would come and speak to them and say, you know, we're really nervous, there, there's not enough sinks, there's not enough uh, stations to, to wash. The producers all said the same thing. They didn't question, they didn't bargain, they didn't negotiate. They just got to sink ASAP. Yeah. They just kept doing these things without getting into a discussion. Anytime crew came to them with concerns about safety issues, they just took care of it because yeah. that was a, a big emotional component for everybody being there on edge. And after they said a week of in this, a few days and a week, 
then the crew uh, uh, had a trust that they were being responsible to producers and had their interests at heart and taking care and things kind of mellowed uh, as things went on. But um, just being able to take care of some of these concerns quickly uh, in your contingency, I guess, was a big asset to the productions. Everyone that's said. great. That's a, that's a good tip. In that I, uh, same line, if I could just add one thing, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I've heard about a, a large production um, uh, that's going on now where people are quarantined for two weeks. You're not allowed to go out much. Maybe they go out for a smoke or something and come back in. They're limited in, the, in where they can move. And then once they're in production, they're still limited. You go to work and you go back. You um, think about recreation for your crew. If it's multi-week production, they've got to have a way to get out. And this particular production brought in somebody to figure out ways to take people within each bubble together to do things that are outside of the hotel uh, on specific walks and spe to go to parks to do things that are outside of the hotel and outside of the production just so they can get a little, you know, clear their heads uh, a little more than just being stuck. So you can't just think of this is where the crew is. I don't have to worry about them. They're in their rooms. You've got to worry about, you know, what they go through. Thank you. Um, I, I don't started... know if we covered, I don't know if we said it at the beginning, um, Lori, but one thing, given that we're talking about budgetary considerations, I am hearing across the board in various contexts and settings and, and different producers that the cost of COVID is running roughly 10 to 15 percent of what your normal budget numbers have mm -hmm. been. So that's what your expectation should be about how much additional money you're going to spend. Yeah, I think that's that's in line. Um, that's in line with what we've been hearing. Um, yeah. The uh, Someone wants to uh, discuss safety issues on currently filming in New Orleans regarding the hurricane. Anyone uh, have any input on when, where the hurricane's going? Only what I've seen in the news. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, a whole that's a whole different set of safety protocols. That's your emergency yeah. plan. So <laughs> a whole different plan. <laughs> <laughs> the plan, the, pl the COVID plan and the hurricane plan. I mean, I would say, you know, interestingly, I have family in both Texas and Louisiana have been thinking about it and, and curious about what is being planned from, you know, just a state government, municipal government standpoint of where sheltering people safely. Um, because there are going to be a lot of people potentially that need to evacuate from their homes and gather in large groups in places and creating a safe space for that to happen with social distancing and PPE and all of that is going to be quite the challenge. Yeah. yeah shelters uh, are cut down by two thirds mm -hmm. uh, or there's one third of the standard um, shelters that they're running in Texas. Um, my recommendation would be in a case like this, if a hurricane is coming that you plan on a shutdown, and a restart, um, just as if you had a uh, uh, discovered an infection, if you had a, enough positive cases that you had to shut down. I think um, if, if you're in Houston, right now it's headed toward Texas and closer to the Texas on the Texas side of the border. But um, keep working until it becomes obvious where you're, uh, where it's gonna be headed and then plan on a full shutdown and then the restart with the same protocol that you started up production in the first place. Great. Um, uh, there's a question about, are there any reduced costs in areas with less COVID? Are the unions making any concessions if you're filming in Australia or areas of Canada with low COVID rates? I do know that they asked you to, uh, to put that in your co potential uh, changes from the safe way forward recommendations in your COVID safety plan and make an argument about why I would cite the infection rates um, in the place that you're going. And I know that they'll look on the, at them on a case by case basis. I think you're always 
uh, safer to go by the protocols that we've put out there. But I think that um, that they are also uh, looking at individual territories, um, understanding that if it has a lower a lower rate, there might be some concessions. So that that has to be a union give to you. If I could just say, because I'm in the throes of it, one thing is because of Safe Way Forward and the AMPTP guidelines, um, those were because we have SAG actors from the states and some IA and DGA crew from the United States that we are following all the the plans and protocols and policies of the AMPTP, the Safe Way Forward. Um, we have added Section 21, which is the Canadian, but because we have a contingency and our two lead actors are SAG as well as others, that the Canadian guilds and unions have matched the, the guidelines of SAG and the DGA. So we aren't getting concessions. Um, just, just to give you my own, like from the field. Yeah, same here. I'm in the same boat in Toronto. The, yeah. the, the US protocol sort of trump anything else that's out there though. You know, the section 21 does have similarities, but I think everything we're doing in the United States is, is more, is just more protective on some level. Yeah. Um, Jess Weiss is saying that the HNS supervisor on his last project um, in the Dominican Republic devised evacuation plans for hurricanes. The, those experts exist and it was worth having them on board. So that's, that's good. Um, I, I had a, we started shooting on an unscripted non-union but SAG uh, doc, doc um, for one of the big, big streamers on Sunday. And I have like a list this long of things that I was taking notes on because there were so many things that I just like found in situ, like I didn't think of. So I'll give you two of them. The first one was I'm standing at the little monitors and my director's next to me. And I turn around because the actor did something that I wanted to make sure they didn't redo in the next take. And I turned around and I couldn't whisper loud enough through the mask. And as when I got loud enough, the sound guy turned around to me like, so it's very difficult to communicate yeah. just my normal, like what I would do every day, you know, on a set to just talk to my director. So by the end of the day, we'd kind of made up like, you know, you know, go again for performance or go again for camera or go again for sound. But I'm, I'm, I'm considering that we should maybe put some sign language, like the, literally the international sign language, um, maybe put together a document that has so that people can start learning some of these things because I think it's gonna happen over the next couple of years that we're gonna be having to communicate this way. Um, so that was one thing that I, I just literally didn't expect. The other thing, and this probably is going to happen on non-union productions more than union productions, but when we move from inside, you know, outside to inside, everyone's like, all right, we're moving. I, by instinct, picked up the video monitor stand, threw the sandbag off and picked it up. And, you know, the cameraman was like, don't touch that. Because then it had to be, you know, I had to wash my hands. They had to sanitize everything. So... The, and, and one of the PAs picked up something for one of the hosts just to try to be helpful. And so all of these things end up being very, um, uh, it's like a heightened, the, the, the host was very upset because someone had touched the water bottle that she was gonna have to drink out of. So we have to like remind everyone. And I think it's just because we're, you know, we're, my, my makeup person brought all the face shields and she went up to the, fir the host the first time without a shield on. And she's the one who brought them. So I think it's just, we're so used to doing things, those of us have been doing this for a long time, in a certain way. We have to constantly be helping each other remember that this is a different way of doing things. And we have to think about every single thing, even trying to help a fellow crew member or cast. So that were, those were, and, and again, well, these will all be, um, oh, this is a good time, Michelle, to tell them about the great thing that you put together for us. Sure. Uh, I should give Connor the credit because he did it actually. Um, so it's production. So we've been asking uh, members who've been on these calls over the past few weeks to write to us on info at Producers Guild. Uh, we've now set up a sort of site where anybody can post in and Jen here has been great posting tons of stuff. Uh, we will be putting more information into it, but it's production tips 
uh, .org. And I'll throw the URL into the chat, but it's where you can ask each other questions, um, resources, if you want to ask a question or you want to, it's just a live document, basically, that'll go alongside the guidelines. So just if you want another person's opinion, and they don't have to be a PGA member, this is open to anyone in the industry. Yeah, we're pooling a bunch of information to this, this site. Um, and I mean, yeah, like I just posted a, a handful of things that, that I had at the tip of my fingers and I'll keep adding more. But like, if you're like me, like you're just getting emails from random vendors and organizations and this and that. And to my knowledge, it doesn't exist in one place. There's different groups that are compiling their own versions, but at least this is ours that we can kind of keep, um, keep all the information in one place and, and add to it as people have, you know, go through their productions and such, so. But again, just a word of caution, the resources that are on there have not been vetted. So there are lists of vendors, but unless someone has written in that they've used them and they were amazing, the PGA hasn't vetted any of them. Yes, this will just be a play, like a repository of all the testing vendors that have approached us or that from the SAG list or from the other lists. And then the idea is that producers who use them or have experience will be able to tell their own experience. This is what I experienced, but it won't actually be a recommendation from the Producers Guild because we would have to have lots of staff on board for a year to figure out how to recommend some of these places. So it'll be at your own discretion to read through the comments and talk to them directly to decide whether or not it's right for your production, obviously, and consult with your health and safety supervisor sort of a Yelp for COVID causes. Nice, I like yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. It's a crowdsourced, producers yeah. crowdsourced uh, uh, place that I, that I feel like one of the things that, uh, you know, I just have to say that producers as, a, producers as a community have come together so well during this time. I, I've never found anyone saying, I can't tell you this, I can't give you this. They've said, I can't give you my plan because my studio says I can't or my network says I can't, but they have been able to then say, but here's what I've been doing on X, Y, Z. And I think that that's because producers are all collegial. We're not competing against each other. And I feel like that this producers production tips.org is going to be a great place for, um, for us all to share information and help us get safer faster and not have to make the same mistakes that somebody else did. Um, you know, by not knowing, setting up sign language with my director beforehand, taking a lot of time <laughs> to figure out what to do. Sarah, thank you. I know you need to late to leave. So thank you so much. Um, I think we are almost at time and there are no more questions. Anyone else want to leave a parting word in the last 90 seconds? I think what I heard from uh, a bunch of producers that had shot was a lot of patience and uh, a lot of understanding and uh, it, 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 it works. And as long as there's a really open communication with everybody, with the crew and the cast, uh, it goes smoothly. When they feel like secrets are happening or something is going on, once they got over hurdles of feeling that the producers would let them know if somebody really was infected, uh, not who it was, but that there was an infection and they felt confident that that was going to be told to them and that steps were going to be in place, uh, things got a much, much simpler uh, and, and calmer. So it's a bumpy start, it sounds like, in the beginning uh, days and, and week or two maybe, but then uh, it, it gets its own rhythm and, you know, it's, I guess, a new norm that we're going to be living with. I also think that remember how when it was before Zoom meetings all day, when we just had normal in-person meetings and now the same meetings, even if you have the same exact number of meetings at the end of the day, you feel exhausted. Mm -hmm. We should ex expect the same thing leaving a set because talking to people like this, when you can't tell whether they're smiling or they're upset at you and it's all by the muffled tone of voice, the muffled tone of voice. It's, it's taxing on your senses to try to kind of figure out who's someone, if someone's upset or they're just trying to tell you something. And that's something that's like the un, unintended consequence. But I, I, how I experienced it at the end of the day was like I felt after the first you know, couple of weeks of these Zooms, which was just a different kind of, of tiredness than I normally had after a day of meetings. Mm -hmm. 
We so, probably also are always in production, kind of in some ways, everything's different each project, but we're always also kind of on autopilot. We sort of know what to do and where to go. And yeah. now you have to stop and yes. kind of rethink a little bit. It's not as auto, your pilot, it's got a... <laughs> <laughs> that, is a that is a good tip. Your, your pilot is not as auto. Right. Well, thank you everyone. Please um, check out productiontips.org. Please give us information there. Put your tips that you found from your own productions. And again, if you have any um, questions that you still need answered, please feel free to email info at producersguild.org. Thank you everyone and have a great night. And thank you all on the task force for being here once again. Thank Appreciate you, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.